Uh, this is the first of two events. Today, Professor McCann will be talking about his research on four stories and landscape realities uh, in Ethiopia. Tomorrow, um, Environmental Studies Brown Bag, the normal brown bag, we will be having a discussion. I'll moderate a discussion with Jim, and the audience will be able to determine what we talk about. It could be uh, anything from his research to um, environment development in East Africa, culture, politics, um, Peace Corps experience. Uh, Jim was a Peace Corps volunteer in Ethiopia back in the day. So um, uh, please come come to that event if you'd like. Uh, ready for questions? It's at 12:15. It's in a different venue. It's normally the Atlanta Cultural Center. At this time, it'll be in the Person Hall Auditorium, and there will be a light lunch provided. So uh, thanks to Andy for, for for organizing that. Uh, I would like to thank uh, a few entities. So uh, this uh, these two events are co-sponsored by Geography, Environmental Studies, Africana, Latin American Studies. And um, some of my colleagues, Kat Carlos and Peter Skull, and I have a, a grant from the National Science Foundation studying church forests in Ethiopia, and, and some funds are being used from that grant as well. Uh, I'd also like to thank, uh, thank uh, Pamela Remlich, uh, Jason K. Wall, Mary Moran, Kendra Smith Howard, Miriam <coughs> Taye, Kat Carlos, and Peter Skull for helping to organize and host the event. Uh, Jim has had a, a long and very productive career uh, studying Ethiopia and other parts of, of East Africa. So let me just uh, uh, highlight a few elements of his career. He's a professor of history at BU. You've been there for most of your career, is that correct? Or when did you start at BU? All of. It's all of, okay. He's uh, the Associate Director for Development uh, at the African Center, Studies Center there. Got his uh, Master's and PhD in History from Michigan State University and a BA in History and Political Science from Northwestern. He's published many, many articles and book chapters. Uh, he's also authored six books, uh, well-received books. Um, some of them focus on the environmental history of Africa and historical ecology of malaria in Ethiopia, and histories of both African cuisine, which I'd like to read, um, as well as a maze in Africa. By the way, those of you come in, if you want to get some food and sit anywhere you want, come on in. Don't be shy. Uh, in addition to his scholarship, uh, he's been very active in discussions within the United States and outside the United States about Africa and Ethiopia. Uh, for example, he's worked with the Food and Agriculture Organization, USAID, uh, UN Development Program, Oxfam. He's testified before the U.S. Congress. And again, as I just mentioned, he, uh, he was a Peace Corps volunteer. So lots of, lots of experience, and I'm looking forward to learning more about that tomorrow. Uh, Kat, Pete, and I met Jim in Ethiopia a few years ago. Uh, we were initiating a project on church forests, and uh, very quickly uh, his name comes up in the literature. He's done a lot of work in northern, northern Ethiopia, uh, and a, a lot of insights that were gleaned from that scholarship. He's also been tremendously helpful in terms of the logistics of working in Ethiopia, the politics of working in Ethiopia, and we're continuing to, to benefit from that expertise. We're actually having a good workshop uh, tomorrow afternoon where we'll discuss some of the details. So we, we're grateful to him for that, for that uh, as well. Uh, in particular, we're interested in uh, his work that relates to um, deforestation narratives in Ethiopia, uh, the conventional wisdom among policymakers, aid organizations, even the local people among academics, uh, in addition to academics, is that, uh, that Ethiopia has been widely deforested. And um, his work, and indeed some of our work, uh, paints a much more complex story. So he'll be referencing elements of that, uh, in, among other things, in, in today's talk. So I'm looking forward to hearing about that. Again, those who just came in, if you want to get some food and then sit down, we've got some seats up front, so, so feel free to come in. As they're sitting down, uh, please give Jim a round of applause and welcome to the And I'm going to turn down the lights slightly so we can see the uh, the paintings. My goodness, there are lots of you here. Uh, welcome. So my interest in talking to you is partially as a result of my interaction with your your uh, faculty and some of you here working at Colgate on the project on Ethiopia on church forests and changing ecology of the way people settle their land and landscapes and take on the, the aspect of human engagement. That's one of the underlying themes that I think we all share here. Um, what I want to tell you, talk about today are basically five stories, some of them, some of them longer, some of them shorter, about 
Ethiopia's landscape, historical landscapes. Let me make that clear distinction. Because we have certain kinds of ways that humans in this particular setting have interacted with their natural world, with the vegetative cover of their landscapes. We have all kinds of features that are prominent in why people do what they do, why landscapes look the way they do, having to do with elevation, having to do with rainfall, having to do with soil types, a whole series of ecological contexts that create what I would call edaphic conditions. I don't know if, uh, is that a word that some students would, would know? So we'll talk about edaphic conditions, tell you where there's forest, where is there, where is there not, what's, what's likely to happen if left alone, what's likely to happen if humans intervene by trying to plant annual crops, grains, uh, legumes, etc. So the first story begins <coughs> in my office in 1990 at Boston University. The phone rang. And it's one of the kind of nice things um, in that African Studies Center is that the phone will ring and you never know what it is. In this case, it was Congress calling, a joint committee of the Congress, in other words, the House and the Senate, were having a hearing. And they said, would you come and testify at this hearing? Uh, can you come here next week? And I said, sure, sounds interesting. Um, and it turns out, when I arrived in Washington in the big paneled room with the gorgeous carpeting and all those things that we have in congressional uh, hearings uh, venues, but there was only one person sitting there facing, uh, I think, four of us that were called in to testify. The person sitting there was Albert Gore. Does anyone know Albert Gore? Mm -hmm. Vice President? <coughs> so he began quizzing us. In other words, sit down in this chair, here's some questions for you. The person in front of me in the testimony um, line was from a Canadian NGO. I don't remember actually remember his name. But he, he told Vice President Gore in answer to his question, well, you know, Ethiopia was covered by 40% forest, and now we have only 4% deforestation. Then it came my turn, and I sat down in front of, it was only Senator Gore. He was the only one there. And I said, you know, I don't think that's true. I think actually the evidence suggests that this 40%, 4% is not based upon evidence. Um, it's certainly not based upon satellite data from 1900. I think our satellites at those days were rather poor in their performance. So I, I felt very good about this. I don't remember what else went on. It was a, a lovely room. He's a gracious, he, he is very often the smartest person in the room, whichever room he happens, happens to be in. So a few months later, I'm standing in line at the BU bookstore to buy some books, and there's a stack of books at the counter. And they're Earth in the Balance by Albert Gore. It was his book, his definitive book, talking about climate change and talking about the dangers of environmental uh, uh, issues. And this was his signature book to launch his, his, his uh, political next step up <coughs> to, toward the executive branch. And I've felt, been very proud of myself. Ah, okay, well, I'm not going to be, going to be uh, lionized by my comment about the 4%. 40% of forest cover in Ethiopia. So I open the book because I'm standing in line and I look up in the index, Ethiopia. Okay, there it is. And what does he say? He says, 40% of Ethiopia covered by forest, 4% now um, reduction to 4%. So in other words, what I said to him had no, no impact whatsoever. He published this because it was a good story. And this is the first story I said I was going to, to tell you. And you know, there you are. My input in being, they flew me to Washington, they did all of these things, they were well treated, <coughs> but who's listening? Um, and it's not that anti-Al Gore statement, but, but there you are. Following that, I, I gave a presentation in Ethiopia itself, presenting the same material, some of which you'll see today, about uh, the nature of forest cover. Is there been a reduction in deforestation process going on in Ethiopia? And I said, I hear some evidence from field work I've done in the field, looking at historical evidence, some of which I'll show to you today, that I will, I will show you this to an audience of people in Ethiopia, university people like yourselves, a room of about this same number of, of people. When I finished the talk, young man in the back raised his hand and he said, 
uh, this is very interesting. I think you've convinced me. This is amazing. But, but please don't tell anyone because the 4%, 40% story allows us to raise money from NGOs, from governments, from aid organizations. And we like to keep this story, he didn't say keep it quiet, but he meant we like the story the way it is. Please don't disabuse us of this, this idea. So that began for me a process of saying, okay, what do I do? I'm a historian. How do I reconstruct the nature of a landscape over the past 100, 150 years? Let me begin to collect evidence from interviews, from visits on the rural landscapes in a number of places, and also to reconstruct from eyewitness accounts of people who, they may have been foreigners, many of them were, most of them were, but they were in fact reporting on what they physically saw. They were not trying to, to say, we hear a story that, etc. So my, my uh, quest began to say, what is the evidence of what the forest cover was? I can begin with, this is a, a beautiful watercolor by a Swiss artist, 1840, 1844. He was, he was there with a British expedition. And he, at that era, they didn't have photographs, but they were valued in terms of their work as geographers and as observers by the accuracy of their paintings. Here's a synoptic view, let me try this, of plowing, seeding, field preparation, and people mo moving into a settled area surrounded by a variety of vegetative forms. Sometimes trees, bushes, and you can see a landscape <coughs> that is rugged, has some vegetation, but you wouldn't call this a heavily forested environment. So, 1844, I take this as being a fairly accurate rendition a synoptic view and that these things are taking place at the same time rather than each through, each through a season. But this is a reasonable uh, facsimile of what the landscape looks like. This is around a place called Ankober, the, the, one of the royal capitals in the 1800s. So here is Ankober. I did a project for Oxfam in which I lived in a rural area. Not even a village. There was no village there. There was no town. Six hours by mule, <coughs> or walking, which is sometimes faster, down, down, down into an area where people had settled. They were affected by famine, but uh, in fact they had stayed in place. The Oxfam project was to interview farmers, understand why they would stayed in place, what, they, what <coughs> could help them maintain their position in this, this particular area. And what was remarkable about this area is it's just the area the British had sent an expedition in 1840, along with the, the Swiss <coughs> painter, along with a number of other Europeans who for the first time really had rediscovered Ethiopia. And imagine that they had to travel from the Red Sea. Um, they missed their flight that day, but they were traveling from the Red Sea across the desert, a very hot desert that was inhospitable by its temperature, by the lack of rainfall, the lack of water sources, and the fact that it was a predominantly Muslim area of Ethiopia. So they're going from the lowlands up to an area that's much higher up, and they're looking up at the, the rim of the mountains of the lowlands, and it looks like, those of you who know the, wizard, the movie The Wizard of Oz, it looks like the Emerald City. So, this is the view looking from down, very similar to the place I was doing my work with Oxfam, and this actually looks very much like the house that, they, that I had. And looking up to the escarpment here, which is a beautiful green. And I should, I, let me read you a quotation of what the British observer reported back to Europe about what Ethiopia looks like. <laughs> had not been in Ethiopia for many years. And he calls it, he writes in his account of this, of this trip, he gets from this perspective looking up, coming out of the desert, he gets a magnificent view of the Abyssinian Alps. Hill rose above hill, clothed in the most luxuriant and vigorous vegetation. 
Mountain towered above mountain, and hill-clad peaks of the most remote range stretched far into the cold blue sky. From the hot lowland desert, the dry desert, he's saying the cold blue sky is an evocative image of something beautiful up there. Um, villages, dark groves of evergreens and rich fields of every hue checkered the broad valley. The setting sun shot a last stream of golden light over the mingled beauties of wild woodland scenery and the labors of Christian husbandmen. So this is an idealized view of what the first Europeans saw as they came back to Ethiopia in 1840 and began to create an image of this idyllic place. So this is the first image that goes back to Europe of <coughs> Ethiopia as the green, beautiful place, the wooded environment. So you have a sense of Again, the Emerald City is this glowing um, human phenomenon on the horizon. This is a black and white, but you, you can have a sense of what that may have looked like there. But when... So, a view, this, this is 19... Um, more recently, this is what the area looks like now. Green, beautiful. Here's the, the one you just saw, the drawing you just saw. But this idyllic looking, it looks like Middle Earth. Those of you who know <coughs> Tolkien. It really does have a sense of the undulation of hills and beautiful green covered in this case, this is 2005, covered with, with vegetation, with plowed fields, with cultivation, human activity. And when we go, go back and look at the environment, specific places the travelers are talking about that we can see today. This is the church. It's on the side of the, of the mountain, below the royal palace, which you'll see in a moment. This church is a, is a beautiful, green, lovely example of human settlement on the slopes. In this case, surrounded by eucalyptus trees. Eucalyptus trees come after 1901, but this is uh, Mikado Church. And you see here, here's the royal cap capital at the top of that hill there. And then the right side there, and the top of that hill, is that church. This is 1840. So you still see the church is still there, <coughs> surrounded by a verdant green uh, <coughs> landscape. And you see 1840, there are no eucalyptus trees there because they don't come until 1901. But you nonetheless see a managed human landscape. So here they see the contrast of the, of the two. So it looks like a, a very uh, well-maintained, well well, well-managed piece of human landscape where you have a church, indication of human settlement, human systems coming together in, in populating the congregation that worships at this place. But this is also a center of political power. So if we look at this rendition of a feast, we see in the upper left-hand corner now, here's the emperor. And I, actually, he's not an emperor. He's a king at this point. <coughs> and you see around him evidence of human activity, of politics. We can read the politics by the posture of this person who's bowing before the king, Salih Selassie. You have a performance going on of dancing, you see people who are being fed and, uh, and given drink, alcoholic uh, drink. You see guards here. So evidence of hierarchy of politics. The imperial palace is a very important place. Surrounded by, as they described, the green forest and the lovely landscape created by human activity. So you have politics and you have the, the um, expression of political ob obedience, obeisance. But we have another view. When the travelers go past the imperial palace there, they come on a landscape that suddenly is very different. As soon as you leave the capital and go further inland, you see a bleak, moor-like landscape, is what the travelers tell us. And we see evidence here of people selling wood selling materials for building fire. So something's missing. What's missing is a vegetative landscape that supports the population. When things are for sale, it means they're scarce. 
So wood in this context was scarce. So how do you account for the, the greenery first witnessed by the travelers, and then in, go one step behind, or several steps behind the uh, Imperial Palace, and what you get is a moor-like landscape, essentially treeless, in which people for fuel and for feeding their animals have to really struggle. These are local people, and also the travelers say, we can't find uh, food for our mules. We can't find firewood. We can't find the things we would need to move with our procession across the landscape. So what they're getting is a denuded landscape that seems to be right next to this beautiful wooded blue-green color, which is a, a gorgeous indicator of human settlement. But what we learn by reading the accounts is that, in fact, the, the, the king here and the royal court was very carefully managing the natural world. There were groups of slaves, this was a slave-owning society, which slaves' job was to go out and collect fuel, firewood, <coughs> building materials from surrounding areas. And they were told very strictly by the king, you may not collect firewood, you may not cut down forests until you've gone three days' walk. So this was a preserved environment. The beauty of that emerald city was, in fact, a preserved environment that was both planted but managed by the population under the strict orders of the political powers that were. So what do you do if you are short of fuel? You have to have populations surviving. They, have, they, they need to cook. They need to build, etc. Here is a house 18, based on a photograph from 1880. And house person standing in front of the house. And what's there on the left side? Anyone want to guess what's there? Not a fair question. Dried cattle manure. Fuel. So here we have an innocent photograph turned into an illustration for a book that shows the fuel supply, something in short supply, which over here, are dried cakes of cow manure. This is 1985. I was there doing the work with, with Oxfam. And we see in the same area people who have put in the labor to preserve the cattle. Oops, sorry. Cattle manure. And you can see very carefully worked. Uh, that may, are made for, for cooking, for heat, and for all the things you would need fuel for. Wood is in short supply. That beautiful verdant environment we saw by the first travelers saying, well, actually, there's not much there. 1985. And then there's a market for, <coughs> for cattle manure. It's collected, it's processed, and this young woman is taking it, taking it to market. Here's someone bringing, bringing water in, into the city, someone who's bringing probably honey here. And you can see that she's carrying it, even though there are, in fact, donkeys which are involved in moving goods to the market as well. So fuel was in scarce supply. The value of cattle lung, not for fertilizers, not for, for um, fertilizing fields, but for human fuel to use in the maintenance of a household. And here is a look of the landscape. This is a photograph turned into a, um, a publishable image of the landscape behind that idyllic looking royal capital. What you see here is an open, treeless landscape. Remember the original idea was that 40% of Ethiopia was covered by forest in 1900, says Al Gore, and, and the, the, the sort of received wisdom. But we, we do see some, looks like a, a tree, a copse, a small uh, area of, of, of trees there. But my guess would be that's around a spring. That's not a typical landscape. This is an unusual configuration where the trees are there because there's some water available, perhaps certain kinds of soil that allow the, the, the growth of trees. Otherwise, treeless, bleak moor is what the Europeans called it. 1888. So forget about 1900. The 1800s it was not there. So if we move further toward what is now the capital of Addis Ababa, which is now, those of you who have been there, you will see a blue-green uh, 
quite distinctive um, le vegetative cover that gives a green blue effect of the city. This is 1888. They built a church at the top of the hill, essentially the foundation of the city of Addis Ababa. And you can see that the predominant vegetation was not much. So you see the churches are built there, signifying, sanctifying the ground. And there are some trees here, but not really not very much. And this is in Totomarium, which is kind of now a tourist site. But you can see vegetation was minimal. The dominant, the default landscape was no trees. Here is 2005, the same place. This is in Totomarium Church. You can see they built a enclosure out of it. People are coming in to worship. Um, and people, of course, people, if they've had breakfast or they have other activities that preclude you from entering the, the church compound here, these people are not allowed in that day, but they're there essentially to mark the event, whether it's a saint's day or it's Sunday, that it is a place still of, of veneration and, and worship, but it no longer is that bleak, uh, open landscape around the church. At the back entrance, you can see <coughs> trees have come in. These, these are, some of these are eucalyptus, some of them are other varieties of, of, of local tree. But you can see that it's filled, the vegetation is filled in. Since 1880, there has been a process of both importation and the allowing of the, of the natural vegetation to regrow. And this is the last one. This, so this is the second. The first one was the Al Gore, that was the first story. Next story was this idyllic land, which turns not to be so idyllic, not so vegetative, vegetatively covered by, um, by trees and by, by brush. And this is very near Deborah Tabor, a site where the, the Colgate group is working. Uh, and what it had, it's interesting, I don't, I don't know the exact location of this relative to the place that you're working, but you can see that this is also a site of importance at the top here. This is the emperor's compound surrounded by, by people who work with the emperors, but still minimal natural vegetation. I would say it's not been removed, but what you have here, what you have are banana trees. You have, for the most part, low undergrowth. And here is Imperial Palace. has got a bit more vegetation, but it is a place that we would describe <coughs> as relatively free of vegetation. So this is 1888, just before the emperor is actually killed uh, fighting against the Sudanese. But it shows a landscape where, we're, where your group is now working. Um, and we don't have very many of these, but this one suggests that a default landscape is one not characterized by trees, by, by vegetation. OK, another example. So we've looked at Ankober. Um, the first place where the Europeans arrived in 1840. We've just now looked at Deborah Tabor in this area <coughs> here. And now we're going to look at another area to see how across these highland zones do we have sort of about vegetation. So now we're about to move to the southern part of, part of Ethiopia. This is a 1927, again, photograph turned into a drawing because it published better, 1927. This is what I would call the default landscape of the southwestern broadleaf forest. This is near Ethiopia, which was eventually conquered by the, the folks in Addis Ababa. But this is the landscape they found in which the natural growth of vegetation includes various kinds of root crops. You see it in terms of the, the leaf, uh, the large leaf, which is on top of the ground. Various kinds of vines, um, grassland undergrowth, and what is a forest in process, but a default forest, I would argue. This is what would happen if you don't touch the landscape. You get this. In the other case, the conditions are such that the default is no trees. So if here is what I would call the southern broadleaf forest scape, when the human labor is reduced, when the political authority has been moved out or been conquered, um, this is the, na the natural as close as we get to it. And when humans are there, 
you have a, still a forested landscape. You have you have the, the typical dwellings of people who live in the area, who are from the Oromo um, population. You see down here, again, root crops that are growing that are growing either planted or part of a forest um, floor cover, and you see you see human settlement. But the default landscape, I would argue here, is one of forest growth. In fact, let me read one more passage for you. What, one of the stories of this area is called Gera. It's a place I work, I work with the Norwegian uh, Save the Children, and later on went back to work with them, and later on have gone back with other organizations to try to understand the changing nature of this place in terms of vegetation and its economic activity. One of the stories here is that the reason this looks this way is because of a curse. In that northern area, the great, the great benefit of having the king there was that he organized things to have growth of vegetation, to have trees. Here, let me read you. An unpopular ruler who was captured by his people and tied up and blindfolded. And of course, he was angry about being deposed. So he, he issued a curse on the people and on the landscape. Uh, he said, he cursed his people and their land and said, as you gave me perpetual darkness, in other words, a blindfold, let your country be swallowed up by the forest. If you cut a single tree, let it be multiplied by ten. May you not see the light, only darkness. The curse is trees. He's cursing the people. So this difference in perceptions of what the landscape means in terms of the nature of humans' interaction with, with a, greater, uh, a greater will is quite opposite depending on where in the country you are, where in the sort of cultural concept of what the forest means. To the person who, who, who cursed people was, let you be covered by forest. Cut down a tree and it'll grow ten times more and you will be covered in darkness. Pretty nasty. Provocation. So here in 1990, this is the same area, within a couple hundred meters of, of, of this, is a small temporary dwelling built by someone who's engaged in cutting down the forest to create open fields for agriculture. So the process of t trying to take back the forest, the forest is strong, the forest is coming back, you must invest labor to hold it back. Quite a different, <coughs> quite a different thing. Here is a forest in process, very much in the same area, not very far, again within a mile or two. You can see the forest itself has been cut back here. The first planting is a field of maize because maize is actually the first thing you want to plant because you can do a, a rough job of plowing, broadcast the seed, and you get your first crop of food in with maize. And the forest and the open field here are in conflict, or at least they're in competition for which kind of vegetative cover is going to control the land. Human agriculture of annual crops, grains, or the forest itself, which is at every opportunity coming back. And, this, and, and in this forest, there are grazing monkeys. There are other kinds of, of animals. Um, there are a whole different vegetative region. I bought a <coughs> large mushroom. And then the, the next kid, 20 feet down the, down the pathway, sold me a grouse, a, a game bird. And I took it back to the camp, and we had um, poultry and uh, mushroom for dinner that night. So the natural world of the forest in competition with the human world of cutting back and planting. Uh, in this case, maize to be followed by F, by other kinds of grains. So it's constant movement back and forth, competition. The more labor you have, the more the humans win. The, the, anything that reduces the labor means the forest begins to push back and to win. Here is a, uh, not a photograph, but a, a reasonable rendering of what it looked like. Gera is the capital of the queen of this area. In this case, you happens to be a queen, not a, not a, a king. But you see in the area, it's, it's pretty much open landscape some trees over here. This is a false banana plant, planted only by humans. It's a reflection of human control of the landscape. And you can see this is an open area where 
royal authority is asserted and maintained by the labor that says, let's keep this open. 1850, middle of the 19th century. And remember, place this against the Al Gore um, loss of 40% um, af after 100 years of deforestation. So this is 1991, that spot. That, that queen is gone, long since gone. Um, regrowth has begun to take place. So what you see here is the regrowth of the forest. Secondary growth first, but some evidence of the taller, in this case, eucalyptus. So that process of struggle between the default wanting to be forest cover, again, this is southern Ethiopia, it's not the same area in, in terms of edaphic conditions as the, other, as the one we saw earlier. The forest is coming back, 1991. When I was there, I, I met, I was introduced to the king. He was no longer in political power. He was an old man living in a house with a very nice oriental rug at his, at his feet. And he wasn't well. Uh, but this was the former kingdom, and he understood and could tell you the oral, the oral histories of the area. Um, but this was, political power was, was being reduced, forest is coming back. And the next year I went back, and people said, the king has died. And I said, well, where is he? Where is the grave? And they said, well, we'll take you to the grave. So this is one year later. They took me back to the spot, and they couldn't find his grave. It had been overgrown. In one year, the overgrowth. Okay, let's go back and look at This is there's vegetation, secondary growth at a lower level. Now, he's found it. He's found the grave. But the overgrowth is remarkable in that it's constant. It's always, if, if you're living here, it feels like a threat as opposed to a, to a blessing. So 1990, the forest is relentless in its um, ability and kind of desire, if you can put that in human terms, to come back. Let's go to another side in this area, still in the south, still in that forested area. And what we see is an Italian mission. Uh, Father Messiah, who's a Capuchin mission, missionary, builds a settlement. This is a mission, a mission compound surrounded by converts. And these are planted false, false banana, uh, insect plants. And again, this is a very natural, human-induced environment. So 1860. So they pushed back. Human labor has been brought to bear. There are some slaves operating here, uh, providing human labor. And the local population is also clearing the land because they want to plant grain. They don't want to extract forest reserve, reserve forest materials, forest resources. They want to plant grain and have every year not have to fight back <coughs> the vegetation. So 1860. Let's go back to this spot. I, my, one of my goals was to say, I, will, I want to visit where this site was. Where was Father Messiah's compound? And so we rode by horseback a few hours. And finally someone said, Aha, this is Abba Leon. This is where the spot was. And I said, show me exactly. And they pointed to the spot. So look at this. And the spot was right here. So you see some of the same vegetation there, but what's happened is, is that the forest and all of the, the, the secondary and, and basic uh, kind of ground level um, vegetation has come back and reclaimed the land. So this constant battle we see in the southern environment, the deficit context, the context in which trees, trees grow, the trees are winning the battle. And it's a little back and forth and back and forth, having to do with human labor, human technology. And so here is the regrowth of the forest. forest here is winning. This is around Afalo. Um, again, a horse ride from the earlier site, but still within the same uh, <coughs> ecological context. Okay, next area. Let's go to a place where we want to look at how important, how sacred is a spot in which there's interaction between human activity, human veneration of a spot. You're recognizing this spot has a sacred nature to it. 
And what does that change look like? And what's the nature of the belief system that's there? And so this one is here near the source of the Nile. Some people say the source of the Nile is, is the Lake Victoria. 80% of the water comes from Ethiopia, not from Lake Victoria. So here, the point at which Ethiopians will tell you, here is the spring from which the Nile comes. It's the one we venerate, which has been recognized for centuries. So, so let's go to that place and see what's the relationship between human activity, human respect for that place, and what the landscape looks like. Here is the road to source, 1974. This is the young Peace Corps volunteer, me, um, going by horse to the site. I still have my agelia in my office in Boston. This is lunch. Uh, this is a food supply. And we're headed up the road, a treeless, largely treeless environment of the land approaching the Blue Nile, the blue source of the Blue Nile. So again, we get a little bit closer. We see Gish Mountain is this area here. We see some vegetation, but not much. Um, we have a sense of a relatively open landscape in, in 1974. So move ahead and, and so when we arri I arrived at the church, which was there, the church was built by Jesuits, by Ethiopians who had converted to the Jesuit Catholic faith. And it was, by 1974, pretty disheveled. But you can see the vegetation that's there is largely eucalyptus trees. There's not much of a definition of this space as being anything <coughs> special. 1974. Okay, back in 2016, the landscape is interesting because these are planted and harvested eucalyptus trees. Eucalyptus trees were introduced to Ethiopia in 1901. And they took off because they grow fast. They're very popular as, not so good as fuel, but as building materials. They allowed cities to grow and, and populations to settle in. But this is, you can almost estimate the size of the trees. So this is what happens when you reforest an area. In eucalyptus, this is a plantation, really. It's only eucalyptus. But you can also see these have been harvested. This is on the road to that venerated church. You shall buy and along the road also, you see interesting cultural evidence. You see an area which has been reforested. In here there's bamboo, there's small eucalyptus, a number of other bits of undergrowth, and pasture. This area is distinctive because the people in this area really like horses. You don't see horses in this fashion elsewhere in Ethiopia. One or two places. Um, in the Wadi, anyone who knows in the Wadi, in, in, in so you find horses there. But it's highly unusual to be horses that is the dominant um, form of, of, they both carry things and they're also used for, for riding. So a mixed environment of forest, a, for, a, a um, equine mixed forest, I call it, an ecology that's distinctive to this place around this venerated site of the source of the, source of the Nile. Same kind of thing, a river, a river that's sort of cut a gash through the, the landscape, but a mixed forest with some eucalyptus there, some bamboo, some range of acacia and other kinds of, of uh, trees and vegetation. And the horse tells you there's something different about this. So this is Gish Mountain I showed you before, up here. But you see also the human... human activity in creating a plantation of planted agriculture and down below is the spring. The spring is the source where the water flows out of the ground which is respected and understood by everyone to be the source of the Nile. Of course it's a small spring and water comes from other tributaries as it flows down toward Egypt, to Sudan and Egypt. But this is the place understood to be the source of the Nile. <coughs> Gish Abbai, which means Abbai is the Ethiopian name for the Blue Nile. Gish is the name of that mountain. Um, and so people have come together, and what do they have here? They have brought water, in this case, plastic water containers, 
to, to collect holy water, to bring it back for uses if, wherever they've come from, that water is special. And one of the things that's happening now is that old church I showed in 1974, which had been built by the Jesuits, and not especially respected in the last, uh, the last decades, now someone with sufficient money is building a new church. A lot of money, a rich person who wants to spend that money to venerate the significance of this spot. But you'll notice in the, the vegetation, it is not one that looks like vegetation was either protected, set aside, or otherwise preserved. And at this spot, one of the ways of signifying the new church is to bring a new ark. The tablet is the place that, where the saint lives. The original church was Michael, St. Michael. But that was the one built by the Jesuits, so it's not so much respected. So when the new person said, here's some money, I want you to bring a new tablet, a new um, ark, to put in the church, and he was Zarbrook, with a persona that has a special connection to the Nile. So his tabot, his the venerated um, ark of his spirit, was brought to the church. And so they have, as they're building the church, they've, they've brought out a portrait that shows his relationship to nature, to the, um, uh, the mercy of God, etc. We look at the bottom of his image, which is there waiting for him to join the church. <coughs> what he did that was quite distinctive, was this. He had put, he was put into prison because of his, his opposition within, within the church. He put special holy books in the water for seven years. He then came back and reclaimed those books. Here he is reclaiming the books now. So his, his access to be venerated as a special saint, to be the new saint of this Source of the Nile church, is that he retrieved the holy books from the river now. They were protected by and consecrated by the river itself. What this tells you is he's retrieving this from Abai, from the, from the Nile waters. These are now holy books. Here he is performing this act of piousness. So in that church you find nuns. Nuns who are there performing the services in, in support of the, the mass, in support of the priests. And they, their presence there is also signifying this is a holy place. They're coming out of the fence. Behind is the sacred ground on which there is vegetation. What does that vegetation mean? Here is the outside of the fence. You can see an elaborate wall done. Inside the fence we see some bamboo, young eucalyptus, and quite old eucalyptus. So there is a process going on of people planting trees, <coughs> letting trees do their their work, and one of the signifying terms that comes out in the work done by this group at the school gate is it said, uh, <coughs> so it means those, those trees and vegetation planted by birds. Birds fly over, they defecate on the land, and out comes vegetation. So it's a natural product. And people recognize this as, as a product of nature because it's, we had nothing to do with this. We didn't plant these trees. The birds did it. This is my friend Zalaram, who was the official guide to the church. And so I did a, sh a short interview with him. We had mutual friends. I said, how is Adukatao? And he said, oh, he's died. I said, where was he buried? Oh, yes, he was buried in the Johannes, the St. John Church in the town where he grew up and where I had, had been teacher. So he gave me a good inside view, and I said, what's the difference between these trees, this vegetation, on that side of the wall, the church is over here, over here, and on this side, where it is not officially within the, within the church fence, he, he said, rightly or wrongly, he said, no difference. And so he, he was the official tour guide, but he was knowledgeable about, about, about the church. But in fact, he could not go into the church compound that day. Neither could I, because we both had breakfast. I was not thinking I should have <coughs> fasted. And then I told the truth. I said I hadn't fasted, so we had to wait outside the, the, uh, the wall. So the, the sacred nature is preserved as the place 
But he said the trees, the difference between these trees and those trees, he didn't, he didn't recognize that there was a difference. So much more to be explored about the meaning of those, of those uh, things. And look, looking down to the spring from whence the Nile comes, people are headed down to collect water down among these trees, which have been planted since 1974. And here's the pilgrim going into the, the, the structure where the, spring, the water actually emerges. 2016, this is last, last May. This photograph is there because that's the water emerging from the spring, which is the, the source of the Nile. And I have this photograph because I just think she's beautiful. Uh, but she's agal, and she's wearing this color. This color is distinctive to what farmers in that area wear. You ask them why, and they say, I don't know, we just like it. So they become slaves to fashion. But one of the people with me was a PhD vice president of the, of the university and a fish specialist from this area. And he had never noticed some of these things. It wasn't, it wasn't in his foremost in his mind as an academic to recognize these things. But the people, of course, recognized the holiness of that water, the sacred nature of the water coming from that spring. Okay, so we have testimony about this. This is a document, 1668, written by the, the Jesuit, quickly translated into, into English. He was Portuguese, but translated into English. And so what we have is a document, contemporaneous document from that period. What he tells us is that these Agal people venerated this place long before there was a church built there. That they, in fact, venerated it by sacrifices of cows, which they kill there, flinging the head into the spring, eating the flesh as holy, laying the bones together in a place designated for that purpose. And so you have the veneration of this place before Christianity by the people who still live there now and who are identifying the ritual act of sacrificing a cow. Now, if you, know, if you know anything about pastoral societies, you don't sacrifice a cow. Cows are valuable. You sacrifice a young, uh, either an old ox, perhaps a young steer, but not a cow. So this is a special act of sacrificing the cow and then for the people to eat the meat um, as part of the, the ritual of, of doing that. So this is 1668, 17th century. Now let's move ahead to the 18th century. That was a, that was a Jesuit priest reporting on this, this sacrificial um, rite. Here is a um, man of the Enlightenment, James Bruce from Scotland, who, is, uh, who does some doctoring, who visits the site of the source of the Nile, and gives us a very good account. In this account, he says, yes, they sacrificed a black heifer, you want to know what a heifer is? This is cow country. This is cow country. Is it not? It is. <laughs> tell me what a heifer is. Heifer is a young female. Um, so, because the young female is both going to be giving birth to the next generation of, of cattle, and it's also a source of milk. So she's the last person that you would sacrifice unless it really had meaning. So again, this person who's not a Jesuit, he's not a Catholic, he's a um, Episcopal, Scottish person, but who knows the local language and is reporting the event. And he knows this is the source of Nile, this is a big deal. He reports to us that they sacrificed a black heifer that never bore a calf. They plunge the head of it into the fountain, into the spring of the, of the Nile, and they wrap it up in its own hide. And they eat, they eat the carcass raw. And so this is a terribly symbolic act about that place. So it is sacred and sanctified by this act, which is similar to the pre-Christian act. So we have continuity through time of saying this is a very important place. And having ate the carcass raw according to their custom, and drunk the Nile water to the exclusion of all other liquids, they pile up the bones, and eventually they burn them. So, eventually the, the Christian king comes to the area and says, okay, enough of this, get out, these rites are, are, are not according to the prescriptions of the, of the Christian, of the Ethiopian Orthodox Christian Church. 
So yet another sign, sign of one, veneration for that spot. That spot is terribly important ritually. And it doesn't matter Christian, pre-Christian, Jesuit, Orthodox Christian. It continues to be venerated. And again, this, is, this site is, is just here. And the last bit I want to share with you is how do we get an emic view of this? These are Europeans. There's one Scottish, a um, person who's, who's external not only by being a Jesuit Portuguese, but he himself is someone who's from the outside. James Bruce, our Scottish witnesses from the outside. What is the local meaning and how do we get at that? As historians and as those who want to understand the meaning of this stuff, how do we get that? You know, we have some uh, notion of what people will say collecting oral tradition. But I have another, the last of the, of the five insights is a local church. Can we think of about 50 minutes just to let you know? Okay. Uh, so this, this is the very last image. This place, there's a church in which there's a painting painted by someone locally who understands the meaning of this. So he, he renders this picture. So let's think of this as a local, as an emic perspective on the relationship between, between humans and nature. Here is a beautiful image painted in the church, gorgeous colors. This is painted in the year of 1909 or so. And it's an idyllic Im uh, image of someone who's collecting the bounties of nature. Here he's got his basket, he's collecting it from the tree. Lovely image. But is this the notion of the relationship between nature and human beings is understood? Well, let's step back. What do we see? We see, yes, this image of the beauty and the bounty of nature, but we also see bigger picture. We have this that says, he's the angel of death. This is a uh, mausoleum, uh, a grave. And what are they doing down here? These two rats, one is called day, one's called night are going to have eaten the root of the tree. So one way or the other, this, this sacred act is about to be defiled by either being shot or the tree falling down or the dragon coming out of the ground is going to get him. And what this says, it says, Misale Alam, which means kind of example of the world. The colleague of mine who was with me, a colleague, he was a teacher at the local school, the English translation he gave me, which I would disagree, he said this is man's fate. Was the, the example of the world is what this says in heart. So we have this image of human relationship to the natural world. It's not something that is sacred in the usual sense. It's something which is dangerous, something that implies the beauty of nature can always be defiled by human perfidy, or by the natural world in terms of the, the dragon, or the snake, or the rats who are going to get this poor fellow. So, thank you. Thank you. We, why don't we take a few questions? I know we're uh, going for 55 minutes, but why don't we take uh, five or ten minutes for questions, and then if you want to come up and talk to Jim in person, you can do that. So, any questions for Professor McCann? I have a question because what we find in the northern part of Ethiopia is obviously very different than in the south. So, well, you um, write about, you talk about this relentless overgrowth and this fighting back of nature. You didn't describe it that way for the north, so you don't feel that the, the people are, are fighting back the forest. The, forest is already the default landscape is what we saw there. The default landscape that's, right. not, that's not a removal of forest by farmers. That is the natural state, the edaphic conditions that in some places um, would result in forest coming because there's a certain kind of profile of soils, certain amount of moisture available. And we could see it at the kind of the end of that. Um, but that's because of particular conditions. So, you know, I would argue that it's no accident that churches find their way to where the springs are. 
to the soils are of a certain quality. So it's not just random. It's in that spot they would say, this is important, we value this, we um, recognize this as sacred, and therefore the church appears there. It's not just, let's do a, 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 a scan and decide to put one every 100 meters or every 10 miles or whatever it would be. It really is, it's not an arbitrary process, it's one that reflects the nature of the conditions. So imagine Al Gore is sitting here and watching your presentation. Um, what are the implications for him of, of your more complex story about forest change? I mean, what, what is, I guess, the, the implications of this for the discussion about forest cover in Ethiopia? Well, my experience with, I mean, if we're talking about Al Gore, he came back and was at Harvard for a meeting. And, so he's, he's very widely read. I think he would say, yeah, this is right. Um, that it's not a simple movement from forest cover to this by humans deforesting. He would, he would see it as more complex. But he was trying to make a point then. This was 1990. He was trying to make his place on the stage for potentially a next president. Sure. Although we certainly have other actors using the 40%, 4% distinction now. So it's, it's still very much a, that, that consensus that there has been dramatic deforestation is still there, yes? The consensus is that it's a good story. The gains it makes money. Okay. Not to say that there's not deforestation in some places, but the natural default in the northern highlands is not to have forest cover. And I have a, 18th, a 19th century document I should have brought and shared with you, with you guys where he's reporting on what the landscape looks like. Jason. Um, so you could say a bit more about the origin of this 40% to 4% story then, like where, where did that come from? Well, you know, it, it, it's a good point. I left that out kind of by mistake. Because when I first said, where does this come from? I started asking people. And among the people who were trained forestry specialists, including good friends, people I really trust, they said, well, you know, that's, I, we got that from Professor von Breitenbach, because he used to say this. And so I began looking around. And in the library of the Institute of Open Studies, you know, going through a card catalog. You all know card catalogs? <laughs> funny thing. And it was Breitenbach, 1962. So I found the article. It was a ch chapter in a edited book in which he says, and he was, he'd been lecturing on this stuff for years. But when he finally wrote it down, it says, all things being equal, the rainfall in Ethiopia would mean that their 40% would be covered by trees. He only was talking about rainfall. So he never went out of Addis Ababa. He was not a field worker. And then this gets picked up by Logan, who's writing about agriculture, by Huffnagel, who's writing about agriculture for, for FAO. And it becomes a story picked up because it works in terms of raising money, and it's some numbers that give you a sense of, okay, deforestation accounts for famine, this and that. So it comes from one place, and when I, when I found Breitenbach's name and then talked to the person who's now head of the Ethiopian Academy of Sciences, um, who's a forester who really knows what he's doing, and I really respect him. He said, yeah, we got that from him. Because students are very, very assiduous in taking notes. And if the professor said it, it must be true. <laughs> so, but that, I, thank you for asking that question, because that really is the origins of this story. Other questions? All right, well, if you have any, please come up and talk to Professor McCann. But thank you for uh,